Also, we have a, a few leftover books that uh, serve as a, a good resource. Uh, some, uh, some people that are in life groups that have them. There are uh, study guides on the book of Ephesians. And also as we study the book of Ephesians together on Sunday mornings, it's a great resource. And so there's some extra books over on the table over there. They are uh, $10 each. You could just put it over in the box. And if you don't have $10, it is our gift to you. So please, we encourage you to take them. It would be wonderful for there to be no more books on that table after service together this morning. So we are finishing up chapter 1 in the book of Ephesians together this morning. Um, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And so let's begin by uh, reading the passage together. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. You may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Praise be to God. You may be seated. So, man, I'm, I'm putting all my uh, sports teams on display this morning. I guess that's just how it came together. But this Thursday uh, is a very exciting day for us all because it's opening night for my favorite hockey team, the New York metropolitan area's best sports franchise, without a doubt my beloved New York Islanders, and uh, if you've ever been in my office before, you'd know that uh, I'm a monster Islanders fan. Like the Cowboys, they're fun, but the Islanders, that's really my team. And so going back to the early 90s, the Islanders have been a constant source of heartbreak and heartache for me. However, in the last couple of years, I've been pretty good, turned into a Stanley Cup contender, and it's been a lot of fun. And let me just say, this year, it might be the year. I'm not saying it is the year. I'm saying it might be. Sports fans, we hope for the best. We prepare for the worst. So, but as a result of my Islanders fandom, from time to time, I can be guilty of getting a little carried away. As I told you, this is really, this is really my team. And so sometimes I'm watching a big game. I can get a little carried away. And Aaron's got to remind me that they can't hear me through the TV set. And uh, even uh, my son Christopher, he thinks it's funny sometimes to steal his mom's phone and to try and record my ridiculous reactions to, to, the, to the Islanders. And actually, a few years ago, I have to confess, after an overtime playoff game, I so spiritedly jumped off the couch. I just jumped for joy after the Islanders scored and won the game that I ended up breaking our couch. And um, Aaron was not happy. But let me say this. That couch is broken in joy, not in anger. And so I think I should get a pass for that. But anyways, with all that being said, is there something in your life that's similar? Something that, that just regularly invokes a certain joyful reaction from you? Something that you happen to be passionate about and you just get this, you're just compelled to get this certain response from? You know, as Christians... Our faith and walk with God is defined by our response to what God has done on our behalf in the good news of the gospel. That that, that word response, essentially when you break down what worship is, you know, worship is one of those churchy words. Worship really is simply, it's our response to God. 
and what God has done for us. And sometimes we can get confused that, that worship is an event, like when we gather here right now on Sunday mornings and go to church, or worship's when we sing, or when we read the Bible, or when we pray. No, worship is everything we do in response to God and what God has done in our, our lives. Worship is, is a lifestyle, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12.1. And so what we find in our passage this morning in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, is that the Apostle Paul, he's so moved by reciting the lavish riches that we have in the gospel in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, which we've been studying together for the last three weeks, where if you, you haven't been with us or following along the last three weeks, the opening passage of Ephesians is this incredibly rich and dense passage where, where Paul just unpacks for us all the different facets of, of the gospel. And, and, and it's, it's a lot. It took us three weeks to get through, and, and it could probably take us a lot longer than that. But, but as Paul is unpacking the riches that we have in Christ, he's then compelled to write under the inspiration of the, the Holy Spirit, one of the most beautiful prayers that we see in all of the New Testament. And, and so what we find is, is that this prayer, it's a prayer of thanksgiving, and it's a prayer of supplication, where Paul begins by giving thanks for God's master plan of salvation, and how the Lord has been mightily at work in the lives of the Ephesian Christians. However, Paul then follows that by interceding on their behalf, by praying for the Ephesian churches in three distinct ways. And, and, and that's going to be the focus of our study this morning. Thanksgiving, riches, and power. And so, number one, Thanksgiving. Paul gives thanks for God's sovereign grace and redemptive love in the life of the church. Number two, riches. Paul prays for the ability to grasp and recognize the riches that God has blessed us with through our union with Christ. And then lastly, number three, power. Paul prays that we would understand and walk in the power of God, the power that defeated death, rose Jesus from the dead, and is reconciling all things in and under Christ. And so with that all being said, let's begin by looking at our first point, Thanksgiving, and read Ephesians 1, verses 15 and 16 together. Paul begins this section, his, this prayer, by saying, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So when Paul says, for this reason, in the beginning of verse 15, as good students of the Bible, what we need to recognize is that Paul is connecting his prayer here in verses 15 and through 23 to the blessings and inexhaustible riches of the gospel that we find in the preceding passages, verses 3 through 14 that I just spoke of that, that we've been covering over the last three weeks. And so Paul's thanksgiving stems from God's sovereign grace, okay? And, and so grace is getting something that you, you don't deserve. And, and God's sovereignty means that, that he is in control of over, over all things. So God's sovereign grace and what he has done to transform the lives of the Ephesian Christians in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, how he has intervened in their lives through his Sovereign grace. So on the screen right now is a picture of a 2002 Nissan Sentra SER. Isn't she a beauty? Now, I don't really know much about cars. I really don't know anything about cars. I've never been much of a car person. However, this car holds a very special place in my heart. See, when I moved just outside of Philadelphia for, for Bible college, I floated the idea with my parents of how great it would be to have a newer and more reliable car in order to travel back and forth between school and home so I could visit them more often. And so that's, that's all I had to do. You know, I, pretty manipulative, but also pretty smart on my part. That's all you have to do. If you have, you know, an Italian mom, all you got to do is like float the idea that this car might not be so safe or reliable and, you know, your baby boy needs to get back and forth from Philadelphia, you know, safe and sound. That's all I had to do. So... I just, you know, put that, you know, planted that seed. 
And so one day I'm looking at cars on the internet and I happened to tell my dad, who is a car person, that I liked how this car had a reputation for being reliable and happened to look cool and have some, you know, decent horsepower for its size. And so he didn't, he didn't say, you know, much in response. So time goes by. My parents make plans to visit me at college one weekend, and my dad asked me if I could. He said, hey, can you come down? Can you meet me outside and help me get some things out of the car? So I sure, said, sure, no problem. So we're, we're walking in the parking lot, and I asked him, where did you park the car? And all of a sudden, the trunk pops open on a black 2002 Nissan Sentra S-E-R, the exact car that I had showed him. And I can't begin to tell you the level of humility I felt when trying to comprehend that my parents would bless me with such a lavish gift, a car. You know, it was just very, it was just extremely overwhelming. And so it was around that time in my life when my attitude towards my parents began to change significantly because it coincided, it definitely coincided with my coming to faith in Christ, which happened for me when I was about 18 years old. But also a huge part of it was coming to an age and time in your life where you begin to realize and recognize that your parents, you know, they're not so dumb after all. And, and they have some, you know, good things to say. And, uh, you know, when you're in your early 20s and you're trying to carve out a life for yourself, you, you come to realize that your parents have done some things in this life. And, and they've done a pretty good job doing some of the things that you yourself are trying to, to figure out, whether it be establishing a career or buying a house and saving and investing well, establishing a family, sustaining a marriage, raising kids, and doing it all with class, character, and integrity. And so I know that not everyone has had the, the blessing and privilege of growing up in a loving home with committed parents, but if you have, there is a time where you begin to recognize just the staggeringly enormous sacrifices that your parents have made in being able to provide you with everything you need to not only reach your potential, but also to pay those blessings forward to the next generation in creating a lasting legacy. And what it really does is it, it, it begins, it, it brings you to a place of thanksgiving in your heart where your relationship with your parents, it begins to change and it grows and it compels you in your desire to see that relationship mature. And it brings you to the place where you, you ask the question with humility and thanksgiving in your heart, where would I really be without my parents' love and support? And you know, the same can be said in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. In our relationship with God, where would we be without the sovereign grace of God? In our lives. Where, where was it when we first encountered that amazing grace? And what state were we in for those of us who have come to faith in Christ? Where is it that God found us? You know, where would we be apart from the blessings of our Heavenly Father who has blessed us, as Ephesians 1-3 says, with every blessing, every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms? Where would we be if God hadn't chosen us before the foundation of the world and adopted us into his family? Who would we be apart from Jesus and his sacrifice on his behalf? We were lost in our sin. Who would we be apart from the grace of God? And so as we continually walk with God, what we will eventually come to realize by his grace and the Spirit's renewing of our hearts and minds is a deeper understanding of who God is, what he saved us from, what he saved us for, and what Jesus has done for us on our behalf. You see, our faith doesn't consist of thoughtlessly following a rule book with robotic compliance. That's, that's religion. That's, that's not what the Christian faith is when you open up the scriptures and you're seeing what God is calling us to. And, and sometimes in our flesh and our hearts, that's what we feel. It's like, God, just, just tell me what you want from me and give me a list so I can just check off all those things, right? And I can just do them and we can just keep score and my score is good enough to, to get into heaven, right? A lot of times that's, that's what we want, but that's, that's not who our God is. And that's not what our God calls us to, right? right? What our faith is, it's this transformative process. It's a process of sanctification. And sanctification is just a word that means it's a process of being made holy like God. It's a journey. 
that when we come to faith, that over time, God makes us more and more like him. He molds us into the image of himself. And so it's this process of sanctification over time where we grow and mature in the knowledge of God and our experience with him. See, the Christian life and faith, what it is, is it's a consistent response to the good news of the gospel of what God has done for us, that we are amazed by his grace. And so therefore, we respond, we're compelled to God's amazing grace and his transcendent love, where we come before him and say, Jesus, I want you to be king over my life because I trust you. Who else would I trust with my life that you would give up your your very life for me, that you would go to the cross on my behalf? You see, we are who we are only because of the grace of God in our lives. Every blessing that we have in our lives, it comes from God. And so do we acknowledge that? Do we acknowledge that everything good in our lives is, is it's just grace upon grace upon grace upon grace? That we, got, we owe God everything, and yet incredibly, our Heavenly Father, He doesn't try to control us with guilt or force us to earn our salvation through our good works. He doesn't tell us that you got to earn your, your place in the family of God. No, he doesn't do that, does that, does he? He simply showers us with this amazing grace and his transcendent love where our salvation is simply a response to who he is and what he has done on our behalf. And that we would come to him and put our faith in him, that we would trust in him by grace through faith in Christ alone. As 1 John one four, uh, as First John four nineteen says, we love because God loved us first. And so let's move ahead to our second point in our text this morning: riches, where Paul prays that we would have the ability to grasp and recognize the riches that God has blessed us with through our union with Christ. And so let's look at uh, Ephesians one seventeen and eighteen. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. A Christian author and Bible commentator Christopher Ashe tells the story of Thelma Howard, who for 20 years worked as the housekeeper for Walt and Lillian Disney. And every Christmas, Walt Disney would call her into his office to give her a Christmas present. And and most likely, she was hoping for a nice cash Christmas bonus or or a tip uh, of some kind. However, every year, instead, Walt Disney would give her stock in his company. Now, sadly, in 1981, Thelma Howard died in poverty. And when her meager possessions were being sorted through, her family discovered among them company stock in Disney worth over $8 million. She was a millionaire and never knew it. See, Thelma Howard never realized or put the necessary effort into trying to understand what Walt Disney had given her. Most likely, Thelma Howard looked at all the different financial terms and lingo on those stock certificates with confusion. That's probably what I would have done. And and having no idea what it all meant, she just stuffed it away in a drawer somewhere or, you know, put it in a a shoebox that ended up being buried in the the bottom of a, a closet. Sadly, so many Christians, we do the same thing with the riches of our inheritance in the gospel. And as a result, we walk through this life in spiritual poverty, not realize what we have, what's available to us, that God has gifted us the incredible gift of salvation and all the different facets of the gospel, and all we need to do is receive that gift. That God has lavished upon us the inexhaustible treasures that come with our union with Christ. You know, many of us, come to doctrinally rich passages of Scripture, like the passage we just covered over the last three weeks, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, and it's easy to get overwhelmed with these theological terms like election and adoption and predestination and grace and redemption and forgiveness and salvation and inheritance and glory and sealing. Like, what is that all about? So overwhelming. How can I possibly understand that? Some of us, we just decide that 
that it's all too complicated, you know? And, and so we just simply say, no, yeah, I don't need that stuff. I'm just going to gloss over it all and, and I'm just going to move on. I just, I'm happy what I know what I know. And I'm happy with what I know. And, and I'm just going to move on to the more, what I feel are the more easily and understandable and supposedly tangible truths that apply to our everyday lives. Or, or, or maybe even worse, what some, some of us might do, and I, and I hope not, is that we approach, uh, we approach our faith like it's some kind of fireish insurance against hell. And we just want to know, hey, what's the bare minimum that I have to do to get into heaven? Because that's really what I'm, I'm interested in. Just tell me the bare minimum and, you know, that's for me. And I'm going to just live the rest of my life, you know, doing the best that I can to be a quote-unquote good person, whatever that is. Um, but what happens is, is when we do that, that's, that's not the gospel. And, and salvation comes from our response to what God has done for us. And it's a loving relationship. And, and there's nothing loving or relationship like in that at all. And so what that looks like is, is if we go down that path, what ends up happening is our lives are completely divorced from the presence and power of God. However, what we find Paul praying for here in verses 17 and 18 is that we would never settle for the amount of God that we have in our lives. That Paul's prayer is that we would know God better and know the depths and riches of our relationship with God through our union with Christ. Because the truth is, is that we can never know God well enough. Because, because God, he has no beginning. He has no end. With God, things never get stale, okay? He has no beginning or end in his, in his person and in his character. And so there is this inherent blessing that we have in our relationship with God where, we're, where the Holy Spirit working within us as Christians gives us the desire to know God more and more. And he keeps revealing himself to us as we grow closer to him. See, the re reality of our relationship with God is that the more we get to know God, the more our desire grows to know him more. It really is amazing. And the way we come to gain this growing knowledge of God and understand the riches of our inheritance in Christ comes from approaching God in prayer and asking him. That we ask God, we say, God, give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. That, that Paul does that exactly right here in verses 17 and 18. And, you know, theologically, this is often referred to as the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's quite simple. We hear the word illumination here, and all that means is that when we trust in Christ, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God's Spirit lives inside of us. And one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit turns the lights on for us. It's the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And we get, begin to see things the way God sees them. And then when we encounter the, the, the Word of God and the Bible and the truths of God, what happens is progressively, over time, not all at once, God begins to reveal His Word to us. And we begin to understand and say, wow, you know, I've read this before, but I never saw it that way. And so over time, when it does, God gives us more and more understanding of himself. It's the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And actually, Jesus speaks of the Spirit's ministry in the life of his followers in John chapter 14, verse 26, where he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You see, it's only the Holy Spirit living inside of us that can enlighten the eyes of our heart to the riches of our glorious inheritance in the gospel. It's why many of the apostles, the great Christian men and, and, and women uh, over the, the centuries who've had great insights in expounding upon the Word of God, that, that they were not people of naturally gifted, superior intellect. But rather, it was their obedience to the Spirit of God that enabled them to grasp and recognize the great spiritual truths that they had within their possession. You see, when we understand God's purposes for salvation, it blesses us with the spirit of hope and the proper perspective that the Christian life, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's not about our, our comfort, our health, our wealth, our personal agendas, or, or living a pain-free life. It's about bringing glory to God by furthering His kingdom purposes, that we were made for Him. We're able to see how the hand of God is always at work in our midst and how God uses 
everything, and I mean everything, especially our trials and hardships, and so many of us can attest to that, can't we? That God uses everything to draw us closer to himself. See, see that's, that's the illumination of the Holy Spirit when we're in this difficult time, that the illumination of the Holy Spirit tells us, okay, God, what are you doing in the midst of this? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? While, while I'm in this trial or hardship, who are you bringing into my path? That I, that I get to, 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 to minister to or, or what have you. That God is always up to something. And it's the illumination of the Holy Spirit that allows us, that, that, that God invites us and allows us to see what it is that he's doing, how he's reconciling all things unto himself in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is God's personal presence with his people that enables us to understand the riches and depth of our faith so that our circumstances lead to our sanctification. Ephesians 1.3 makes it very clear that God has given us everything we need by blessing us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. It's just a matter of us continually walking with him in faith, in the spirit, patiently, as he reveals himself to us over time in the wonderful truths of Scripture. So it's imperative that we recognize what we have in our possession as Christians that God has revealed to us the mystery of his will and the depths and riches of God's master plan of salvation. We are all, every one of us, are spiritual billionaires. It's whether or not you recognize it or not. What a beautiful prayer this is to pray that God would open up the eyes of our hearts to, to these inexhaustible riches in our possession, whether it be for ourselves, our friends, our family members, or our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so let's move ahead to our third and final point this morning, power, and how Paul prays that we would understand and walk in the power of God. It's the power that defeated death, rose Jesus from the dead, and is reconciling all things in and under Christ. And so with that, let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 23. This is the, to the end of chapter 1 of Ephesians. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Now there is a, quite a bit to unpack and break down in these five remarkable verses that close out chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. But in, in beginning here in, in verse, verses 19 and 20, we see Paul begin to talk about power. And at first glance, it's easy to read this passage and come away with the notion that, that, that nobody's mightier than Jesus. He's the best. Nobody compares to him. And as the king of kings, he rules and reigns over heaven and earth for eternity. And of course, that's all 110% true. Absolutely true. But what we find here is that Paul gets extremely specific and nuanced about Jesus' power, as well as his rule and reign. You see, there's so much we could say about the power of God in Christ, whether it be his power in creation, his power to execute judgment, the power of his presence, and on and on and we could go. However, in verse 20, we find that Paul is very specific about, about the kind of power he's talking about here. He's, talking, he's specifically referring to the power that raised Jesus from the dead. See, this is the power that God makes available to us in Christ, which Jesus used to transform death into resurrection life. That's what we need to understand. That's the story of the cross. That the evil powers of this world thought that they could kill the king of glory. And so they looked to crucify him and they crucified him. But what they couldn't understand is that this was part of God's master plan of salvation. And so what Jesus does, what God does is he uses the cross and he turns it all upside down. He reverses it all. And what happens is, is the cross and the death of Christ ends up turning out to turn the entire world on its head, where through the cross it offers eternal life to the entire world. See, that's what God does. That's the power of the resurrection. He has the power to take death 
and turn it upside down and turn it into life. The kind of a power Paul is referring to here couldn't be any more different than our world and culture's definition and understanding of power. See, our world and culture's definition of, of power is rooted in selfishness and domination and oppression, and it just brings forth more death. While Jesus' resurrection power is the kind of power that selflessly chooses to give up status and authority. It's the kind of power that decides to absorb and take the hit for others at great personal cost. It's the power Jesus displays to us on the cross, where even though he was innocent, Free from guilt and sin in every way, Jesus chose to both live and die on our behalf to make atonement for our sin, that we were guilty in our sin. And Jesus said, no way. I'm going to take your sin. Even though I'm completely innocent, I'm going to be your substitute. I'm going to step into your place, and I'm going to absorb the wrath and the penalty and the consequences for your sin. I'm going to take the hit. And he does this, why? To bring about life. Also that he could offer to us eternal life, that we be saved, right, by grace through faith in him alone, that by trusting in Jesus Christ, we be saved from being eternally crushed by our sin. And this is what's known as the good news of the gospel. Bible scholar and creator of the, of the Bible Project, Tim Mackey, writes, What God's power is up to in the world is not for us to fulfill our wildest selfish dreams, but rather it is the power to take the most tragic, sinful, selfish human being, and through an encounter with Jesus, he turns us into something that is life-giving physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Death doesn't get the last word. Because Jesus rose from the dead and exerted his power over death, reversing its effects and hold on us. And so as chapter 1 comes to a close, what the Apostle Paul makes clear to us here is that this resurrection power is what has exalted Jesus far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And so whether it be Satan and his demonic forces of evil that are being referred to here as the powers and dominion, that belong to a, an unseen dimension, and we're going to get to all that in, in Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul addresses spiritual warfare in the arm of God. Or, or, or Paul's also addressing that Satan's influence on the, the rulers and authorities of this world that can be seen by their sinful and selfish actions that lead to the brokenness, destruction, and death that we encounter on a daily basis, right? We're all very familiar with that kind of death and brokenness, right? We're, we're all pretty much, if not all, the overwhelming majority of our government leaders are incredibly selfish and, and don't do anything, don't use their power to help others, but rather for themselves, and it leads to death and destruction, right? We can all attest to that. But what we need to remember is, and, and we can get so overwhelmed by by the, the evil we can't encounter in this world. But what we need to remember is, 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 the, is, is the reality of the situation. And the reality is, is that Jesus is victorious over them all. And it's not only in, just in this age, but it's in the age to come. And so as we await the age to come, which is referring to Jesus' second coming, where, where, where he's going to come and he's going to establish his kingdom and his kingdom is going to be fully realized... Right? And he's going to put death to death forever. Right? And it's going to be that way. It's going to last this perfection for all of eternity where, where, where we're going to be in the presence of God and, and enjoy his presence forever. That's what that we're offered in the gospel. And so that's, the, that's this, this age to come. But what Paul reveals to us is that there is a place. There is a place in the here and now where the reality exists, where, where Jesus is acknowledged and he's recognized as Lord and King. It, it's, it's the place where people have had their, uh, the eyes of their hearts enlightened. They've, they've had the eyes of their hearts enlightened by God to walk with him in thanksgiving, to recognize and grasp the riches of their spiritual inheritance, and to live in the power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. And this special place is known as the church. 
We read in verses 22 and 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And we need to be very careful here by what we mean by the church and how we define the church. The church is not an organization. The church is not an institution, right? That's that's not what Paul is referring to here. The church is the people of God. See, the church is where the presence of God lives and, and resides. It's not a building. It's, it's the people. Right? Because we are the temple of God because the Holy Spirit lives inside of the people of God. So again, it's not a building, but it, it's the people of God where the Holy Spirit dwells, where we have been given eyes to see the spiritual realities of this age and the age to come. And we recognize and live under, under the lordship of our one true king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the church is, is this one place on earth where the power of the resurrection is affirmed. And it's displayed through the testimonies of the people of God and how Jesus, he meets us in the lowest moments of our lives. That there's so many of us that have shared our stories with one another about where we were before we received Jesus' resurrection power and how that turned our lives upside down for the glory of God. That, that Jesus, he enters into our lowest moments, our moments of death. And through his resurrection power, he reverses their intended effect and he transforms it to result in our salvation where when we, when we surrender to him as Lord by grace through faith in him alone. And again, this is the story of the cross. As we read in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see, the church is where the power of the resurrection has caused the future, that age to come, Jesus' final triumph at his second coming. It's caused the future to come crashing into the present where we enjoy his resurrection power right here and right now, where we're able to rediscover our humanity for the first time in Christ. It's the life that God always meant us to live and be who God initially created us to be. And so the question we're faced with as individuals is, is there a specific area of our lives that we've been withholding from God that is in desperate need of his resurrection power and to come under the rule and reign of King Jesus? And so as we close, I'd like to give us three specific challenges to consider what this might look like in our world today in our everyday lives. And so number one, power. How can we best exemplify resurrection power as the people of God? That instead of being self-serving and domineering, how can we use the power and influence Jesus has blessed us with to serve and meet the needs of others? Is, Is there somewhere God is calling us to lay down our rights rather than fight for them? Number two, riches. How can we use our riches, both spiritual and material, to serve God? That instead of using our money frivolously on our own selfish and personal wants and needs, how can we purposely use our finances to meet the needs of others, to further the kingdom of God? The same goes for our time and our talents. How is God calling us to specifically serve others with our time, talents, and treasures? And then lastly, number three, thanksgiving. How can we love and serve others with the heart of thanksgiving? In our relationships, whether it be with our coworkers, our spouse, our children, extended family, friends, or fellow church members, do we understand, have we grasped the blessings that God has given us that have caused us to well up with thanksgiving? Thank you, God. Thank you for all that you've given me. That it leads us to make it a practice to seek first their benefit before our own. And so what would it look like if one by one, these different areas of our lives came under the influence of King Jesus. It would look like the kingdom of God, the church that God has called us to be, a community of grace, authenticity, thanksgiving, unity, servanthood, selflessness, and mercy, because this is who God has created us and called us to be a people compelled to worship him.
in spirit, and in truth. I'd like to ask the worship team to come up to the platform. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your amazing grace and your transcendent love in our lives, how you show us what love is at the cross, how you reveal to us this amazing grace and love through the gospel. And so, Father, I pray for those of us here that maybe have lost our way and have got kind of stuck, that we would recognize that you never, ever stop revealing to us who you are. You never, ever stop chasing after us and loving us. You call us to be more and more like you over time, molding us and forming us into your image where we get to be a blessing not only to others, but we're blessed ourselves. And Father, I also want to pray for those who don't have the saving knowledge of you, who, who don't have a personal relationship with you. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, not out of guilt, not out of obligation, not out of anything like that, but Lord, that if you truly are, Lord, if you are someone here this morning that you feel like, man, I've never, I've never heard the truth of God explained this way before. It's because you've, you've never heard the gospel. You've never had the Holy Spirit open the eyes of your heart. And so if, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, if you've never experienced the power of the resurrection in your life, if you want to know what that's like, what it's like to live with the heart of thanksgiving, and I pray this morning would be the morning where you take that step to see, well, what, what is this God? What is this Jesus all about? And that you would open up the word of God, that you would have Maybe you were brought here with a good friend or a family member and just be able to ask questions and see what is this God all about? If the Holy Spirit, if it feels like the Holy Spirit is just on you, just chasing after you this morning, it's not an accident that you're here. So Lord, we thank you for that amazing grace for each and every one of us, how you have met us in those moments of death and you've reversed them, you've transformed them to offering us eternal life. And so, Lord, for that, we are eternally grateful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand and worship.